I didn't know what Paul's talk was going to be. And this morning I was thinking about it and I, I realized that the tradition in wildlife sculpture of people moving from museum taxidermy into sculpture is a rich tradition. Certainly Carl Lakeley and James Clark, who did the great halls at the Natural History Museum in New York, Rockwell um, in, in, this, in this century, Kent Olberg was a museum taxidermist. Um, I think Danny Ostemiller, in fact, was a museum taxidermist. Uh, in this room, uh, Roger Martin, uh, for years, basically, was a museum taxidermist. And as you know, Paul was for over three decades the chief taxidermist for the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. And the thing about this is that the job of a taxidermist is fundamentally different from the job of a sculptor. A taxidermist is basically trying to make something as real as they can make it. A sculptor is trying to basically decide what is it that he wants you to see about his vision of what he's making. And making that transition is one of the hardest things in sculpture. Uh, it's really no different than those people who have tried to move from illustration to actual painting. You know, you're no longer trying to tell people what something looks like. You're trying to say, this is what I want you to see. Um, Paul's transition from when I first met him to what he's doing now has been extraordinary, and you're going to hear about it. Paul, please. Thank you very much. Right on form. Um, so thank you, Walter. Thank you for stealing my thunder on uh, what my whole talk is going to be. Just, just kidding. Um, <laughs> but, and, and Walter forgot to mention, or the, uh, uh, is that he is also a museum taxidermist uh, and has that background, and uh, it's a rich tradition. Um, thank you very much for that, Walter, and for, and for yesterday's words. Uh, thanks to Alice and the Woodson family for creating this space for us and creating this amazing tradition uh, for for the Woodson Museum and Birds and Art. Um, I wouldn't be here without my parents. I'm thrilled that my mother could be here. Um, and, uh, uh, my, my dad, who is a happy hermit, uh, is not here, um, but um, has had a, an enormous influence on educating me as a taxidermist and as a model maker and um, instilling those skills in me as well. Um, and to my wife, who is here, uh, who's been an amazing partner for me over the years, uh, very happy uh, that you're here and that people here can get to know what an amazing person she is. Um, my employees here, the Reimer Studio All-Stars, they're here as well. Uh, so get to meet them. They're awesome. Um, uh, and uh, for my dear friend Paul Ruther, who wrote like an amazing uh, essay for me, making me sound like I actually know what I'm doing. Um, and thank you, Paul, and thank you for you and Nancy being here. I appreciate it. Uh, and for everyone who's traveled to be here and all the gracious, lovely words that people have said about, you know, about this honor for me, um, all of you, thank you so much. Um, and to the people that I'm meeting now this year and, and who I'll, you know, get to know better as time goes by, um, thank you very much. Uh, the, the birds in our community uh, that we meet here created by the museum is this a phenomenal uh, a phenomenal situation like where we can meet and get to know each other and grow um, the fact that the Walsall uh, supports this the community you know like a place like this can only exist in a community where you have a place like Walsall that, com that will support an, uh, a museum and can support public art that says a lot about <laughs> A community when you find a place that is rich in public art has an amazing museum for a relatively small place and so thank you to the community at Walsall for this. Um, when I first got here uh, to Birds and Art um, you know I had uh, you know met all these people but to just to say something about Walter which is um, a funny little story. Uh, I remember being at Birds, uh, being at the Waterfowl Festival some years before I ever got into Birds and Art, and um, 
his studio person came by. He's like, oh, you're, you're in Pointer Rocks. You need to come over and see us. I'm like, who are you? And she's like, oh, I work for Walter Matthias. So I went over and I met him. And he said, yeah, give me a call sometime. And, uh, and so, you know, like months later, I worked up the nerve to, to give him a call. And um, I said, hi, Walter. This is Paul Reimer. I met you at the um, Waterfowl Festival. <laughs> you know, and I was like, you said that I should come over and see your studio. And, and Walter's like, oh, yeah, um, well, uh, um, my wife just had a baby today. And, uh, and so, like, we have to do it all. I was like, okay, great, bye. <laughs> and, uh, and I hung up, terrified. Um, and then, um, <laughs> so, uh, some years later, I got to Birds and Art. We re-met, and um, that was the start of this amazing friendship and you know, he just lives down the road, and so we would go back and visit. Um, you know, like I was blown away when he's like, hey, I'm working on this eagle. Come over and check it out, and would go over there. And, and so it's been this 15 years back and forth, um, and I have lots of great relationships like that thanks to places like Birds and Art. So, you know, meet one another, talk to one another, help each other, learn from each other. It's an amazing place. So, um, all right, enough about that. So. Um, <laughs> So I want to talk about um, my taxonomy background. I'm going to talk a little bit about that and then talk about what I do and how I use that. But as Walter was saying, um, being a taxidermist, a museum taxidermist, or any kind of taxidermist is, um, you know, you learn all these skills. You learn about anatomy. You learn about making things. You have to learn about how to tan skins and skin animals and all this sort of stuff. And in that trade, uh, you really have to learn a lot of stuff, but you don't necessarily it doesn't really learn, you don't really learn about making art out of it. And taxidermists, in the worst way, want to be considered artists. Um, uh, but to quote Don Rambat, you can't use something to represent itself. And, um, which is really important, I think. And, um, and so, you know, like doing these things and trying to figure this stuff out, when, you, when I first started getting into taxidermy, it was just bronze taxidermy, you know, like, trying to get all this other stuff done. So uh, I'm going to take you on a little journey of my, um, of my life as an artist. Um, this is my first attempts at bird art as a teenager. Um, so with apologies to the carvers and painters in the room, um, these are things that I did. Um, so I've always loved birds. Um, and, uh, and so this is just sort of early attempts of, uh, <laughs> of my doing art. Um, this is, um, my dad had a taxidermy shop in, in, you know, at the house, and so, you know, like that's me skinning a short-tailed shrew, I think, and uh, painting a cast of, um, I don't know, a cercropia moth or something. Uh, and so, fortunately for me, I had, um, you know, like a dad that was always, you know, doing those kinds of things, had those projects in the shop, and so, you know, I learned how to do those things, and at one point or another, like the cast of snakes and turtles and caterpillars. I was better at painting those things than the people in his shop. So a lot of times those came to me and I got to do those things. And so I kind of just would just do anything, you know, like you just, well, just get in there and do it. Um, and I think that's a really important lesson. Just grab something by the horns and if you fail, just, just you know, wash it off and do it again. So um, um, this is, um, this is a gorilla that uh, died at the Oklahoma Zoo named Bomb Bomb. And uh, so this is just sort of one of the things that we did. Uh, oddly enough, there is a commercial taxidermy form for a gorilla, but whenever you'd mount a gorilla, it never fits. So you always have to cut it up and change the size and the position. Um, and I took uh, molds and made casts of the hands and feet so that you would have, like the mount would have the fingerprints and all that. I made death masks of the head so that we could, so that that individual would be that individual. Because it was going back to Oklahoma City, people knew this animal, and so it's there. So that w these are things that you know, we were able to do to create that um, specimen. Um, this is, um, years ago, this is back when I had hair. Um, uh, so <laughs> back in the, this had to be in the 80s. Uh, they, uh, at one point after they rediscovered that black-footed ferrets were not extinct, 
um, they were kind of monitoring them. And then I think an outbreak of, if I'm not mistaken, distemper broke out. And so they captured all of the ones that they knew about. So they were breeding them in captivity. I think they separated the populations in three different populations. And one of them was the zoo's conservation facility, uh, the Smithsonian one uh, the, out in Front Royal, Virginia. And so they were trying to figure out whether baby ferrets had uh, innate predator avoidance behavior. And so the two main predators were badgers and great horned owls. So I mounted this uh, badger on a radio controlled truck. <laughs> and uh, your federal dollars uh, <laughs> were used to um, have researchers chasing baby ferrets around <laughs> with uh, a radio controlled badger. And um, <laughs> you're welcome. Uh, so, uh, and also swinging a great horned owl in a flying pose over their heads to see if they were, um, if they had that in innate behavior performance. I mean, I actually don't know how the research ended, but. Oh, and, that, and a side note too, somehow or another, this photo made it to like the Smithsonian newspaper and it ended up on Reuters. And so then Dave Barry, uh, the, the columnist, got a hold of it and um, had a lot of fun with robo badgers um, and federal dollars, et cetera. So that was my first big claim to fame, so being the butt of a Dave Barry joke. So um, this is um, the restoration of the Fenicovi elephant. Um, at, uh, at the National Museum of Natural History. Um, this was mounted by a guy named Neil Deaton. It's probably one of the largest elephants ever mounted. It is a massive specimen. Um, the interesting thing about elephant taxidermy is that most taxidermy is just a skin over top of a, of a, a mannequin or a form. Um, this one is done in a very different way. They, 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 they make an armature, they cover it in clay, um, and they put the skin over it, and they put all the wrinkles, and they push them all into the clay. Because an elephant is really defined by its wrinkles and not by its hair, the wrinkles are really important. So they, they, Carl Lakeley came up with this idea. So you shove all the wrinkles into the clay and you get the thing looking good over the clay. And then the skin is in pieces. And then you cover those pieces with plaster and burlap. And then you take them apart in pieces and you dig all the clay out. And then you put more clay, more plaster, in this case it was fiberglass, on the inside. And you let it dry for like six or 12 months. And so it doesn't allow the, sh the skin to shrink and lose all the wrinkles. So then the parts are all put back together and to create kind of the beautiful bubbly, uh, bumpy little texture of the elephant, this one was, they, they like literally sprayed, they sprayed wax over the skin uh, to, to create that beautiful texture. And then over the years, they we had a very specific, when I was there, it was a very specific protocol on how you deal with the elephant because there was wax on the surface it was very soft. And then um, we had a new guy coming in and cleaning. I'm telling my boss, you can't let him just dust that thing. It's going to ruin the thing. Well, over the years, as the staff of, of the museum got smaller and smaller, they just dusted it. And they started knocking all the highlights off. So they hired us um, to come in and restore it. Um, and so uh, I posted this on Facebook. And um, this photo right here, uh, uh, Paula Waterman's like, best work photo ever. Um, so, anyways, you got to get everything just right. Uh, these are just more examples of some of the taxonomy that I had done at, this, at the museum. This is in the Mammal Hall. Um, this is a, a night monkey or an owl monkey. Um, and this was um, something that died at a zoo down in Florida. And uh, I skinned it, and then I had to wrap a body. I cast the head in dental, uh, I made a mold in dental alginate, cast it in auto uh, body putty, and then um, rebuilt the, the body with uh, Excelsior wrap bodies, very traditional old uh, taxonomy techniques, wrapped uh, the legs, you know, and, and, and then made this like, movable armature that could be, you know, put on and then done that. This, this orang was um, one that was in a zoo, it was our zoo, at the, and I think at the Smithsonian, and it, and it died, and it was in this huge vat of alcohol. And um, so we went there, the head had been cut off, 
because when they do necropsies of animals, they'd take the eyes and the brains out and they had taken all the internal organs out. So the skin, the head was wrapped up in cheesecloth and shoved in the abdominal cavity. So we skinned it and then we car I carved a blue foam, like this nice styrofoam, I carved a body out of that. Did the same thing um, uh, with the hands and feet as I did with the gorilla. We made rubber molds of those, <coughs> cast those, and then used the cast so that the that the hand, fingerprints and all the, the hand and foot detail would be uh, captured in that. Um, this little macaque here, oops, here we go. Uh, this little macaque here, I mounted that on, uh, Roger Martin has a vervet monkey taxidermy form. So I cut that up into a bunch of different pieces and, uh, and, and use that. So three different primates mounted in three completely different ways. I love mounting primates. They're, they're so interesting. And especially the big ones, they're, they're so individual because you know they're they're just like people. So, um, some more things. Uh, uh, this is a Grevy zebra, um, which is uh, much larger than what most people see when they go to Southern Africa for like you know Lacaman or the Birchall zebra. So you can buy zebra forms, but um, but so much smaller. And um, I got a, a zebra skull I think from Roger a, a Grevy zebra and it's uh, you know like the eye to nose measurement is four inches longer than a Birchall zebra so that was completely resculpted and then all the form is completely altered I'll, I'll show you later how I do alterations for positions the okapi was an animal from a California zoo and I have a um, another later on I have a thing showing how Roger Martin helped us sculpt that form from the bones, which is really, really cool. Um, see, I'm losing myself in my notes here. Um, uh, this is a vampire bat. I think my wife cast the curator's foot. Um, so <laughs> the curator for the mammal hall came in and, and uh, you know, pushed her foot in some dental alginate and they made the cast and then I'm, they gave me the cast and then I mounted the, the, the bat on that. Um, <laughs> The manatees, these are like, th out of like 275 animals uh, specimens in the mammal hall, there are only three that are not real. And two of them are this uh, manatee. Uh, this gives me a chance to brag on my wife. Um, the adult manatee, there is actually somebody who sells a fiberglass cast of a manatee. But clearly they found a manatee, put it in a parking lot, and made this mold of a manatee because it's like this big heffalump thing with a completely <laughs> flat bottom, which is not what manatees look like. So Carolyn spent all this time cutting the cast up into sections, bending it, re-sculpting everything. And we wanted to do um, uh, a, a, have a nursing calf on there. So we were able to find, we had a, a juvenile manatee in one of the alcohol baths um, at, in the collection. And so I made a dental alginate uh, mold of the face and then we cast the bondo and then Carolyn and I carved the whole thing out of styrofoam and then she covered it with, uh, with epoxy to create the texture. But that's, that's some of my wife's amazing work. Um, I'm not doing a lot of taxidermy now, but um, I, taxidermy is kind of like the Hotel California. You can check out any time you want, but you can never really leave. <laughs> um, and so we have um, what um, my friends Brian and Christina, Christina is here. Um, we know her as Tina the Preener. Um, and um, so we have birthday mountain uh, bird, bird, bird weekends. And so like, we'll get together for a weekend and mount birds, more often than not just for hunting buddies. Um, and so, you know, this is just something that we do just to get together, have to, you know, like eat, have fun, mount birds. And uh, <laughs> I, st I still fit, mount a few birds with a local taxidermist, mostly just so that it gives me time to have my hands on birds. Um, I still do that. It gives me a chance to continue to, you know, like look at the anatomy of birds. Uh, and bird taxonomy is very dynamic. You can really put them and change them around and do all this other stuff. And so I love doing these kinds of things, um, especially with friends. Oh, just a side note, this, I cheated a little bit. The, the photo of Christina is not a, bird, a birthday uh, mounting weekend. This was in Swaziland. We went there in 2008, back where I used to work, and we collected some birds for an exhibit they were working on, and that is a giant kingfisher, which is really, really cool. So... Uh, and speaking of Swaziland, um, in 
1996, I went to Swaziland, now known as Iswatini, um, uh, to build a natural history wing for their National Museum. And not really knowing how the hell I was going to do all this stuff with no industry to support me, I wrote a letter to Roger Martin, who I knew from taxonomy conventions, but we weren't the pals we are now. I said, hey, do you want to trade a safari for some taxonomy, taxonomy forms? So he did come, and we had a great time, um, and, you know, bashing around the bush. And um, so this is just part of the production. I, was, I painted murals and built dioramas. Yep, apologize for the painting. It's, you know, it's just a taxidermist doing murals. Um, <laughs> but there's, uh, you know, so we did all kinds of different things, cultural things. Um, this is, on one end of the, the hall, we had a huge painting of the Lofeld, which is typical sort of African savanna. Um, and there's a, a marula tree there in, in, in Swaziland. The culture there, the marula is like super important culturally because they make their, their favorite liquor with it. Um, so we made like a tree and baboons and all the stuff that ate. Uh, that. The Highfeld is a beautiful alpine mountains uh, that was uh, the, like the, the typical uh, kopis. And uh, so we just made those. Uh, we just figured out how to get materials there. And um, the zebra is uh, on a, one of Roger Martin forms. The lion is just sculpted over a lion taxonomy form. We just sculpted it with epoxy over top of that. So. And I was living with some people who had a German Shepherd, and I cut hair off of the dog to <laughs> put around the ears and the tail. So. Uh, a couple other things we did. We wanted, like, our whole goal around this museum in Swaziland was to show how Swazi culture was related to nature. So the traditional attire, they have the different clothes and whatnot, and feathers and, and things. And then another thing was muti, which is. Um, uh, in most African cultures, medicine and magic are usually the same word. Um, and so one, a little side note, this bird here, the hammer cop, which people may have seen, uh, is uh, called a seguane. And um, they are like really bad medicine there. People hate them uh, for whatever, can't even remember why they hate those. But um, I had carcasses in the freezer that I was using uh, to, to make forms and stuff, and I was noticing that they were going away. <laughs> and I knew the guy that was stealing the meat. Um, and so when I skinned out this hammer cop, I saved the um, thing. And so I, um, I was talking to another guy that worked there, this guy who was like my best friend there, and I said, hey, uh, don't tell anybody. <laughs> but uh, I gave this guy I gave him some seguane, and uh, he's like, what? It's like, yeah, he's, I didn't tell him. I just told him it was a bird. <laughs> and, and I said, so, but he loved it. It was great. It's fine. And, uh, and so I knew he would tell everybody. And, uh, and so no one messed with my freezers after that. So nothing ever went missing again. Don't mess with the umulungu. Uh, so. Uh, this was another fun project that I did. We didn't, I didn't, everything I didn't do was taxonomy. This was an um, articulation of Grover Krantz and Clyde. Grover Krantz, for you uh, uh, Bigfoot enthusiasts out there, um, he was the first anthropologist to look at Bigfoot evidence in a scientific way. Um, and so all the Sasquatch folks out there, like, this is their guy. They love the guy. Because he actually didn't, like, dispute the existence of Sasquatch. But anyway, um, so I had to articulate. Um, uh, he was another. He was one of those guys that was an anthropologist that would actually look at you know um, evidence, forensic evidence, and help uh, police forces you know, solve crimes and stuff. So he would use the dog. The, the dog is Clyde. Would use him to like find bodies and all kinds of stuff. Anyway, so he's he cleaned the bones. Grover actually cleaned the bones of his dog after he died. Gave those to the Smithsonian. Um, and then he donated his body to, to the anthropology department and um, had asked them, it's like, we would, I would love to have my skeleton used for educational purposes. Well, we're not really sure if we can do that. It's really expensive. But they found a way to do it. Um, the curator, a friend of ours named Dave Hunt, said to Grover, uh, he was sick with cancer and he, before he died, he said, can you send us some pictures of you so we can have them in the record? And Dave said, um, yes, uh, I, I got the envelope. And um, Kroger was like 70 at the time. And he says, I pulled out these photos from, and he was like, 
all these pictures of Grover just nude, you know? (laughs) Science moves on. Um, So, um, and then a couple other funny stories about this. Um, My boss at the time was this lovely, mild-mannered, you know, guy with dreadlocks who was like a Marine veteran, you know, and he really didn't know about what I did. He was just my boss. And one day he came in and he saw me messing with my bones all over the place and the skull is on the table. And he goes, yeah, man, where's this from? Like, how old is it? And then I pointed to this picture um, on the wall and I said, yeah, this is, he died like 10 years ago. And Charles is like, no, (laughs) no. And he just backed out of my shop and did not come back in my shop for like two months. On the other side of it, Doug Owsley, who was the curator of this exhibit that this was for, he was around one evening and I said, hey, you want to come and check out this? And he came by and he he was looking. And this is a guy that he knew. And um, he's looking at his spine. He's like, wow, he really had bad arthritis. Um, And then he goes, wow, he was a really hard brusher too. (laughs) You know, you see that? (laughs) Different ways to look at a skeleton (laughs) from a museum point of view. So, um, oh, and one other thing, because I can't help myself is um, when this thing was on display, it was in this big glass case, and this guard came up to me and he goes, hey man, what's that little bone there below the dog? (laughs) I said, oh, that's a baculum. He goes, what's a baculum? I'm like, what do you think it is? (laughs) He goes, no man, the grandmas are gonna be writing letters, man. We can't have this. (laughs) Anyways. Uh, Another non-taxidermy but really wonderful museum project I worked on, and this is one I got to work on with my talented wife, was back in um, the early 2000s. We went to Mongolia to make a reproduction of a deer stone. The deer stones are these really cool monolithic kind of things with these carved in relief. They're petroglyphs basically, but they're like these reindeer bird spirits, and then they have like Bronze Age looking belts around the middle. Um, you can't really see it here, but then they have like Bronze Age tools hanging off of them. And these all I think predated, you know, like sort of the current people in Mongolia. Um, and we were doing a Mongolia exhibit at the museum. So um, this guy here, Bill, was the anthropologist who was starting to do some research there around deer stones and how they related to Inuit and Arctic peoples and whatnot. Um, we, so we went there to make a mold of this um, and uh, to, to have, give one to the Mongolians and to have one at the, at the Smithsonian. Um, so we had to, so we knew the thing was like 12 feet tall and we had to take from here to Mongolia, like, I don't know, it was like 15 gallons of silicone and rubber and we had to figure out how we were going to make, you know, the mold. So we figured out all that stuff. So this is us making the, uh, painting the rubber silicone rubber on there Um, and then after that's done we had to come up with a way to do a mother mold so that this floppy rubber mold can be used in a real way Um, and then another little thing we were we had all these parts we were all in pieces and we had them in bags and suitcases and stuff and so Carolyn and I are are at the airport in Ulaanbaatar and we kept hearing this will Tom Carroll you know report and like and it's like Tom Carroll and I said to Carolyn like that's you you're Carolyn Thome and because they were, they were freaking out about like all this weird stuff in these suitcases. Anyway, so we, we, we got uh, checked out by the, uh, the Mongolian. Uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, um, so then after the mold was done and we brought it back, uh, Carolyn remade the mother mold. Um, and then we started laying it up in fiberglass. Uh, of like the genius that she came up with was this was granite. So you can imagine like all the multicolored little minerals that are in granite. You're never going to be able to paint that cast to make it look like the granite. So we took lots of photos, brought back little uh, rocks from the area that looked like that stone was come, came from. So Carolyn took uh, polyester resin, fiberglass resin, and tinted it. She fi- identified all the different colors in the sample and created like you know a dark brown one and an ochre one and a tan one and a, a dark you know a light brown one, and she like made and poured the resin out into thin uh, sort of films and then just as it was starting to catalyze she put it through like a grinder and made her own sand 
And so then that was then uh, put into the gel coat. And so that was the thing on the surface there. And so that's what was that's what you see. So when it came out of the mold, um, it just looked like the real stone. So um, so it's Carolyn figuring out how to reinvent Corian countertops. Um, <laughs> Uh, and a little more taxidermy stuff. We had did we did the uh, okapi, um, at, uh, and there's no way that there's any kind of commercial forms for that. So Roger Martin graciously offered to come up to the museum and help us sculpt the form with from bone. So we we did it in two trips. He came up from North Carolina, and we spent about a day or two articulating the skeleton, um, and you know with with a, having it all put together in the position that we wanted, and then we let it dry for. A while um, and then after everything was dry we wanted to keep the bones in the research collection so we wrapped everything in foil and then uh, he came up and helped us so we we're pouring um, expanding urethane um, onto pieces of plastic and as it would expand do you guys know what expanding urethane is that great stuff that you put in it like it just it gets much much bigger so we are pouring it in big vats and then using the film to like push it up against um, up against the form and then um, and then everything is like carved down and once we got the general form then we were able to start putting clay on it and then we would test fit the skin to make sure everything was right um, and uh, and then the final so to this point just to just to sort of like brag on Roger on how we did this in four days um, we we fine-tuned it and smoothed it out which took way longer but to actually get that form, uh, that's why Roger is like always the smartest guy in the room. So, um, all right. So this, I wanna show this goes back to, um, this is a taxonomy score sheet at, for a competition. And this goes back to what Walter was talking about in terms of like how taxidermists, you see this huge range of experience that a taxidermist can have. Um, but then you go to a competition where you're gonna like try to you know be the guy, um, and so they have um, there's all these things about you know the anatomy and like tiny details are way more important than big details. Um, shrinkage of skin that's huge sin if you have shrinkage. Uh, you know like uh, color and structure and symmetry. Everything has to be symmetrical. I mean they even have a thing on odor. Um, and for, for an extra point, um, composition. So out of 100 points, composition and art is one point in a taxidermy competition. So this is the tradition that when taxidermists start doing bronze sculpture, you can tell, like, oh, yeah, this guy was a taxidermist. Um, and because everything is there, but that's the problem. Everything is there. Um, so to get away from those kinds of things, um, I, um, this is sort of like one of those uh, quotes that everybody uses about Picasso. Um, but for me, it's really about, you know, when I, was, when I got to the Smithsonian at 21 years old, I was always the dumbest guy in the room. You know, I was surrounded by people who were, you know, uh, you know, machinists and sculptors and model makers who were doing like the most amazing stuff and they had been doing the trade way longer than I had been alive. And then curators. And so, you know, I just got really comfortable with the fact that I was always gonna be the dumbest guy in the room. And so the best thing to do is just learn from these folks. Um, and so that was like very rich and fertile ground. Um, and so the thing is, be observant, you know, take it in. You know, you're, I mean, like, are we literally stealing? Some people do. Um, but, um, but no, like, learn from those. Like, figure out how to come up with these ideas and stuff. So I have, like, um, three sort of, like, touchstone quotes that I use from, um, so these are my three people that I, these are the people I always, like, lean to. So, you know, um, abstract through knowledge. I mean, that seems pretty straightforward. You know, like, there's... You, you, you do these things, um, but like, like fake it till you make it, you know, sooner or later you're gonna get caught if you're just faking it. So there's so much information out there. There's people who know, there's resources, there's books, there's the internet, learn the stuff. Um, and then in taxonomy, symmetry is king. Uh, an old friend of mine, Walt Horton, was like, symmetry is bad. 
And, um, and so, you know, just always trying to figure out how to make things asymmetrical, how to create a, an interesting balance or lack of balance to create movement and always figure out ways to like torque things so that they're dynamic. And then my favorite is never let anatomy get in the way of good art. Uh, so, um, and thank you, Roger, for that. I, I, I wear that out all the time, so. So some of you who follow me on um, Instagram know that I do these little Benny Hill uh, time-lapse things. So I'm gonna show how I take and use sort of the taxidermy method to come up with like base armatures for my sculptures. So um, this is me starting um, a mountain lion. So I just, I draw out the shape in a very just broadside kind of way and I cut them out uh, and then this is just like the pink foam that you, insulation foam that you buy at Home Depot. And I use that great stuff to glue them together um, and then just screw them together and that makes great glue. Um, and then, you know, that all gets done pretty quickly. I've probably spent an hour putting that all together. Um, and then once that is done, then um, I start carving in my anatomy. I'm not worried about position right now. I'm just getting my base anatomy down. Um, and I have great, I mean, you can see that I've got like from bobcats that I did before, there's a Roger Martin bobcat hanging up in the wall there. I use that, you know, like just sort of get like long bone measurements, but there's great books that have skeletal reference um, and muscular reference. Um, and those things are really easy to find. Um, I mean, like people still can use books. Um, <laughs> so I'm basically just getting the basic anatomy down, the musculature down. And then once I get that, then I can start positioning it the way I want to position it. But before I do that, since the, the foam is relatively weak, um, I bend aluminum wires um, in the, in the, basically to the length of the bones. Um, and then I trace it onto the foam, I trench it, and then I put the wire in there, and then I put the more expanding urethane in there, and then just let it cure. And so now I have this internal armature that will allow me to move things around without having to break it and re-glue it together all the time. Um, this is, now that I've got my armatures inside, then I'm gonna start moving things around. <laughs> so this, this lion is gonna be basically walking away, turning around and looking back at you so, you know, like I figure out, you know, like where the movable parts on, you know, you don't want to do it in the back because there's a pelvis there. But, you know, between the pelvis and the shoulders, there's a rib cage and they're very flexible. So you cut a pie shape out and you turn it, you know, 180 degrees and you glue it on there and then you get, you can start getting the turns. Um, here this is, you know, kind of moving it around. And now that there's armatures in the legs, I can cut the legs off. And then I can bend, and I can cut them at the joints, and then I can start articulating the legs, um, and do all the. This is me just attaching the leg. That's going to be, you know, you can see I've done some of that already. So to this point, I probably have like, in at this point, I probably have less than two days in the sculpture. So um, because. You know, I don't have to be, unlike taxidermy, I don't have to put every muscle in there. It doesn't, a skin doesn't have to go over this, so I can be pretty rough with it. And then I just start adding clay. Um, and then at that point then, and oh, and I've painted the foam the color of my clay. I take a lump of clay to Home Depot and I buy a gallon of house paint that's the color of the clay. And um, that helps the foam stick and it, and it just helps me see the form better. A lot of times I paint it and like, oh, that's totally wrong and I recut it and readjust it. Um, so then, you know, this is where the work starts. You know, like this is all the easy part, you know. Um, and uh, this is uh, just, um, just a quick little sample of how I just start the details. Um, you know, you put the eyes in, you start sculpting it, and I probably fiddled around <laughs> with that and redid that, you know, three or four times before I finally got it the way I want. But you can see that once you start doing that, it kind of starts coming together. Um, so sometimes you can actually get reference. Um, so I took a turkey, I was going to mount this, this is the candidate, it's, it's in the, on the grounds here. 
um, and I mounted a turkey in the position I wanted it. And so I just started carving more of the foam using the expanding foam, um, and then that's really straightforward. That turkey has um, been referenced for a number of sculptures. Um, so um, people have used that. That's been around the block a couple of times for other, other people. Um, so, um, and then um, I was doing a bald eagle, war eagle, which is also here. Um, you know, you can't, the federal government frowns upon uh, collecting and mounting bald eagles. Uh, so, um, so there are taxidermy products, uh, cast feet and cast heads. These come from a guy named Stefan Savitas, who is an occasional birds and art sculptor. Um, but he, like a lot of us, you know, is, was a taxidermist and he's got a whole line of bird mounting products. And they are invaluable. So what I start doing is I, I start using aluminum for the toes and the, and, the, and the feet and rebuild those. And you can see how I've, um, you know, like kind of just made the talons by using these as reference. Same thing with the head. There's the head. I've got that. I've all sculpted all that. And then there's a wire that comes out. And then I put it in my foam. One thing that I have found um, that I often get wrong is with an open wing bird, uh, because wings are like arms, they, there's a million different angles that they can be in. And um, the secondaries and primaries on, on wings are literally attached to the bone. And so as that wing opens up, it's, you can really mess up the angle that those feathers need to come out in the lines. Um, and I, I have ruined a lot of sculptures and cast them in bronze to realize that I got it wrong. So um, I decided to make a, an eagle wing and so I got, you know, like measurements, made every feather, uh, every primary and secondary on a wing, uh, and then cut them out of cardboard, attached wire to the quills. And then I, I have a secret agent in the federal government uh, <laughs> that can help me get reference. Um, sadly, uh, when uh, Vivek Ramaswamy becomes president, uh, she will be part of the 75% of the federal works force that will be laid off. You had a nice run, Christina. So um, anyway, you can get this reference in other places, but I basically built, um, I built a wing. It's hinged. I just took the measurements, drew it up, and so you've got the, the humerus and all the other stuff there. So then I attached all of the feathers to that, and that allowed me to create a template that allowed me to do this, um, uh, to try different angles and to get the, the wing feathers right. After I was done, I sent a picture of this to... Uh, Roger and Walter and Gary Staub and Walter said, Reimer, this is the dumbest thing you've ever done. <laughs> but just to make sure, you should probably do a mallard and a quail. <laughs> so. Uh, so I was able to try different wings um, and come up with different designs. I had the body kind of put together and this allowed me to create different wing open and literally just cut out a template and just try different things, figure out what actually worked, which angles worked, um, and then how to actually do that. And then once I did that, I was able to transfer those lines as I carved uh, the feathers onto the foam. Um, No, it's just reference. It's reference. So yeah, you know, so that, that's just laying around the shop, and then you know I can use it whenever I want. I still have to make the quail and the mallard one, but <laughs> I'm going to be on it as soon as I get home. Um, so, uh, but it was really helpful. I, I did, I did, I think make the secondaries too small in that, but it still really helped. Still really helped with. You can actually see I lengthened them in the in the foam because I realized they were just a little too short. Um, but um, so. This is my favorite view of that eagle, and I, I, I'm really happy with at least that view. So, um, and then um, this is uh, this is our foundry. Um, when uh, just before COVID hit, uh, even when COVID hit, you know, foundries were losing employees. You know, there was all kinds of stuff going on. There was labor shortages. We all heard all of these things. So we just started uh, about three years ago. We started casting a lot of not a lot of it, but like small and mediums that we did. And it kind of helps me, um, you know, with uh, my quality control. It also helps us control inventory, especially in things that are that are really, you know, like really sales. Because you order something from a foundry, it might take you three to six months, and I don't know what my demand is. When I have pieces that are that are really selling a lot and it's something that we can cast, we do that. And so Mike and Virginia are have really 
I mean, like I started the thing trying to figure it out, but they have really refined this. Oh, this is a video, I keep forgetting. Um, so uh, this is um, a cast, if I'm not mistaken, this is one of the outlaw owls, probably the one that's in the birds and arts. So we've melted the bronze, you can see it kind of just sort of liquid 2000 degree bronze, and we're pouring it into the ceramic mold. And you can see that they're wearing OSHA-approved short sleeve shirts. Um, yeah. So this is, this is my, these are my outlaws, Mike and Virginia. And then Zelly uh, is our newest employee, and she's in her zoot suit, uh, sandblasting her turkey. So these are other pieces that people probably haven't seen of mine. Um, the magpies, but these magpies are on the Corbett 19 piece. Um, I love musical references in my work. That's a Beatles, uh, a Beatles line. Um, I, I love the, the immediacy of the emotional response that music gives us. And I'm really jealous of <laughs> music and, and actors and their art form of being able to create that emotional response. And so I'm just stealing their, their thunder a little bit by using those musical references. Um, the attempted murder, this is uh, two crows on a barbed wire fence, um, attempted murder. Uh, the attempted murder theme, I'm kind of exploring that and trying to squeeze as much juice out of that lemon as I can. <laughs> um, so yeah, we made the, I made the barbed wire out of using a bronze welding rod and fabricating barbed wire out of that. So The uh, yellow-billed hornbills are uh, inspired from uh, a trip that uh, Carolyn and I went with Brian and Christina, um, and these are the courtship dances that they have. The burrowing owls are uh, inspired from a trip down to um, Puerto Penasco in Mexico on the on Baja. Um, I, you know, these that's the great thing about you know people are always giving me art. It's like all you do is hunt and fish, um, and uh, you know I wish that's all I did. But uh, those are the places where I get my that's where I get my ideas. That's where I get my inspiration. That's where I get like my enthusiasm for for creating these stories and and these little tableaus. Uh, this is the polar bear Walter was talking about yesterday um, in Tulsa, um, which is weird. <laughs> 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 the um, uh, the Tul uh, Tulsa has an art show called Nature Works, and um, they have this monument program where they, they um, submit an idea, and um, then people, come, people who've been part of that, that wildlife art show come with a little maquette. And then they pick that maquette, and so then they establish a budget for it, um, and uh, you have to kind of work within their budget. And then what they do is they go out and they get sponsors, and uh, they get you know like each sponsor is like you know twenty five hundred bucks, and they'll get like forty of those. So they raise a hundred grand, and then they pay the artist, and then they donate the piece to the town, and then they use the leftover money uh, for conservation projects uh, around eastern Oklahoma. And I have, I have three of these. Um, and they are crazy for American, uh, and for a long time it was all Oklahoma animals and they ran out of those. <laughs> they have like 30 of these things around town. And so then they started, I have a bighorn sheep there <laughs> and a polar bear. <laughs> so, uh, the cranes um, were uh, a commission I got from the Topeka Zoo. They had this Japanese garden and they wanted some, uh, a red crown, the Japanese red crown cranes. And so they asked me to do them, and I'm like, I'm never gonna sell another set of Japanese red crown cranes. So what I did was I sculpted um, sandhill cranes at one and a half life size, so that I would be able to have a small addition of those. And then I took the waxes from these sandhill crane molds and then altered them so that they would be, it was a lot of like changing the waxes around, but then I was able to do the one of a kind thing for the zoo. And cranes are phenomenal. Um, they're, they're just so graceful, and you can do so many things with them. Um, and I, I just I love the um, more musical, um, more musical sort of um, things. These all these owls, they're life size great horned owls. The the whaling one here on the on this side is is one that's in the show. We cast all of these in our shop. Um, they're all on different posts and. 
uh, breaking Don Rambat's rule of using something to represent itself, um, I use usually use real barn beans, but not always. So, and these are birds on art. Um, so uh, just some fun little things where uh, I got a red shoulder on red birds and a, a fly catcher on some fly catchers. So, um, and then last but not least, uh, Freddie and Nilla. So um, anyway, so. That's all I have. If anyone has any questions, I'd happily answer them. <laughs>